What the fuck? All right. I'll, I'll totally take full credit for that, whatever that was. Oh, when you took no more bullets in the room? So, uh, <laughs> I usually wait a minute or two before each one, but I guess this is what we're getting. We got this thing over here completely open. We got this group over here completely packed, but fuck them, I make more noise than both of them combined. Because I'm passionate about what I care about. So, I guess we're starting. We'll figure out later when we start this thing on the video. You know, the, the opening ceremonies video is already up on YouTube. Amazing. Come on. People are going to be like, so when do the videos come out? Three days ago? That's amazing. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Scott. Computer historian, raconteur, general asshole, and more than happy to be at his second beautiful Derby Con. Last year I was only here for a day because I had to run off somewhere else. Not this time. I'm here all weekend. So if you have stuff you want to tell me about, I am really up for hearing from you for pretty much the whole weekend. I'm going to really enjoy this time here. Name of the talk is called Rescuing Prince of Persia from the Sands of Time. This is a retro talk. I'm not talking about new things. If you're looking for the latest things, you want to go to that side. And if you want to talk about dealing with the latest things, you want to go to that side. I'm merely the guy telling you about what once was and how I have helped to make it live again. How many people here have seen a talk, have not seen a talk by me before? Wow. Okay, so already you're like, I'm going up this little hill on the thing going, I don't think this was what I wanted. I was actually kind of looking for the teacup ride. The fuck is going on here? <laughs> He tells, he, he tells a lot of stories. Let me tell you a little bit about the time that I had my ass totally, totally kicked in public speaking. Um, if it's not obvious, I'm a little comfortable on stage. So I, uh, when I was in high school, would run for school president because it would force the entire school to listen to me. My chances of election were very low, but you know, when you start to get up towards the big presentation and you've whipped out this whole thing you've been working on and uh, you know, nobody runs for school president even as a joke without some little part of them going, but wouldn't it be awesome if, oh shit, I would shake this little town up. Well, I got up and I did my stupid talk, and my talk was essentially uh, going to be a bunch of random, stupid, let's put digital clocks in the classrooms. This is, I should mention this is a while back. Um, you know, I wanted to make our school mascot a ferret. And I, anyway, I had this stupid little plan to do this really funny, hilarious talk. And this other classmate of mine got in in front of me, of the five of us who were running. There was the just the little stand-up kid, Glenn, who we knew was going to win. But anyway, so suddenly on, on comes David Mechner. And David Mechner was this really cool uh, social friend of mine. And he got up. And he gave a speech so beautiful in its satire and its delivery that I realized that I had been playing, you know, basically JV basketball. And I was totally, totally unprepared for the NBA style quality. David's platform, and when I say this, I'm describing it as one might describe the Gettysburg Address as, and here we dedicate this spot. Um, he basically said, so when you guys go to your school for your reunions, you don't want to come back to a completely new place where you don't recognize anything and nothing that made this school great for you is still here. What you want is you want as little change as possible. And I propose to do nothing for this year to guarantee that what you find in five or ten years is exactly how you left it. And it was delivered with such beauty. And I got up, and I realized that I had not brought my A-game. And so I always remember that. This has to be 25 years ago. And I still remember it because it was such a powerful sense of maybe you should take what you do seriously. I say this also because I go to a lot of conventions where I listen to talks where the person starts the talk explaining to you exactly why you don't want to stay and listen to them. And that can be improved. I'm just saying. Now, David Mechner had a brother who I knew of, but David he had already graduated from school. His name was Jordan Mechner. And Jordan Mechner was a computer kid. He had like been involved in computers. And he had made a game 
and I knew that game was selling out there and that it was very popular. You know, I knew David and we were social, but Jordan had gone on in his life and he had like gone off to college and he was living the life of being a computer game programmer. And the game that he had made was a game called Karateka. Now Karateka was a game that was a fighting game for the Apple II in which your character after climbing a mountain would face off against a ever growing in power set of enemies who would then proceed to fall at your feet and then you would walk up to the princess and she'd kick your shit out. Um, well, this game has very beautiful graphics for the Apple II era. Very beautiful graphics. I mean, there was just a beautifully created piece of work. And um, it's got this very strong sense of atmosphere and strength and you feel like you're seeing more than you are. I mean, if you go back and you really piece it through, you realize how little of the screen is being drawn and therefore how fast it works. But this game sold like gangbusters. It was transferred everywhere. It was uh, turned into a Commodore 64 game. It was in an early uh, Japanese game console system. It went for the Atari. It went for a terrible three-color version for the IBM, which I have here, where your basic awesome colors are cyan, white, and blue. That's going to change the fucking world, isn't it? Cyan, white, and blue is your palette. You know? Um, I'm, I'm one of those people who's like, the CSS people, they got it so easy. They're like, oh no, it's off format. I'm like, you don't have three colors. This, by the way, is a 320 by 200 image. But still, it still radiates this amazing atmosphere, right? Something about the way Jordan approached it was almost cinematic in the way he did it. And the fact was, Jordan had dreams of becoming a screenwriter, of becoming a writer of movies, but computers had been what he had initially gotten involved in. Um, he worked for a company called Groderbund, which was uh, a, a word meaning brotherhood that was run by two brothers and a sister, the Carlstons, and it existed in the early 1980s, and they produced a whole variety of games that people might remember, like Load Runner, and uh, obviously Karataka, and they produced something called the Bank Street Writer, which was one of the early, easier word processors. And so this company produced what we think of as consumer software and had a strong brand image and were very much people who produced uh, uh, emotional reaction in the audience that they were working with, right? So this is actually Jordan's Karataka disc. And what's interesting to it, to me about it is that the thing is obviously on the outs, right? You know, here this thing has been stored as best as he could for years and years. And I think this has to be, we have to make this clear. Jordan saved everything. Everything. You see, he would, like, collect notes about what his ideas were, and he would put them into a notebook. He would uh, photocopy receipts. He would transcribe ideas. He would do rough drawings. He kept everything. All of his code is printed out. Everything he was working on. And so as a result, he um, uh, uh, had the medium and the writing for Karataka. So he was able to keep that forever. Now, he kept it on floppy disks. And here's the thing about floppy disks. They haven't really stood the test of time very well. Not very well at all. Um, who here is not familiar with a floppy disk? Who's here not, who here is not personally familiar with a floppy disk? Big difference. See, the thing is, is so much in life we hear about and they become lore, and they become these kind of um, kind of shorthand ideas, right? Like some people here will know about Wolfman Jack. Some people here will know about flappers. Some people here will know about Gutenberg Bibles, and they'll know about these items even though they've never actually met one. This is a floppy disk, and it's got this nice little hole in it that you put the spindle in. It spins like that. It's got a window over here that reads. It's got this. I like the two people leaving. All he did was talk about a fucking floppy disk. <laughs> There's a little thing here called the index hole, which again, now we're starting to get to the weird voodoo. Basically, every once in a while when it would spin, you could shine a light through here and you would know how many times the disk actually spun. So without this little index thing, it would have no idea where to read or what to do. So anyway, these are floppy disks. And the fact is, is that there were a lot of them sold, um, very similar to what we have now with USB. These things were everywhere. And there were companies like Bassif and Maxell who would produce these amazing, you know, creations. And so 
the Max Cells had all the marketing of being brilliant and wonderful and providing you all this amazing, you know, uh, material. Well, my pause is recorded forever, but still. Is everyone happy here? Yes. I, I, no, you're all happy. You're delighted. And no, I'm just talking about the sound guys. Anyway, so I thought I'd, first of all, just show you this. This is a compact floppy disk. Uh, this doesn't exist. Uh, you will not find any of these. This is basically a cartridge-based floppy disk. Nobody wanted this. It's gone. I hope nobody saved anything on it, because it's gone. But it was presented to people back then as just another option, historically. And so, you know, perhaps some people actually put something on these, and I feel so bad for them, because it's never going to come out. Because there's nothing left. There's no machine to read it from, and so on. And believe me, if, if you're not excited about the capacity for storage and the amazing ways you could store your Apple II discs, this is not the talk for you. Because there were a whole variety of awesome ways to store these things. As you can see, you can have your sexy binder. See, if you'll notice, I don't have a laser pointer here, you can see on the top left the A, the mini, e the mini easel binder has a place where you can write a long story about what this 360K floppy contains on it. And it's, I mean, each binder is only 550 in 1982 dollars. So it's a bargain. You are taking this home. I know it. And I just wanted to also point out that there were ones for cassettes and for cartridges. So you can see, you know, this bad boy comes out. It's a night of entertainment on your 2600. You just pull that thing out and you're like, well, what does tonight's buffet present us? And I also wanted to point out, because you see this old stuff really has its own humor. If you look on the bottom right, you can see the panoply of colors you are offered, which is chocolate, tan, and wood grain. Imagine anything else in life where if your three options were chocolate, tan, or wood grain, you would not punch the guy's shit out. Um, so anyway, floppies, like them. There's a five and a quarter inch. There's a three and a half inch. There are eight inch floppies out there. This is a custom case that I had made to be able to read from uh, uh, floppies through various means. So... Um, <clears throat> in the modern era, it's harder to buy five and a quarter inch floppy drives. You got to kind of go shopping, and you're not going to be able to go shopping locally. So you buy them on eBay, or you buy them through wholesaling, and so on. They're on their way out. This is Jordan Mechner now. Um, Jordan uh, had gone on to work in Hollywood. He lives in Hollywood now. And he was uh, successfully involved with a whole bunch of projects, most notably the Prince of Persia. Now, Prince of Persia was something he was working on after Karataka and produced this game. And uh, it's got many of the same elements of really well-done graphics and amazing rotoscoping. Um, ironically, and I don't know how many people know this, but uh, he used models and then rotoscoped them using a projector onto his Apple II. And the model was David. So his brother is the little guy running. So if you want to punch the shit out of Jordan's brother, just go play Prince of Persia. Because that's him running and jumping. And uh, in some cases, they're using Errol Flynn movies. But mostly, it's mostly his brother running around. And Prince of Persia, even more beautiful. Such wonderful graphics, now working in full color. And this is all in 1989. So in 1989... Prince of Persia is the way to go. It's a running, jumping, sword fighting game that just left Karatka in the dust. And Jordan, again, made a good amount of money from it and, again, sold it through Broderbund. But his time with Broderbund and Broderbund's time was, was coming to a close, as was the Apple II. Now, again, Prince of Persia was ported to IBM, to Commodore, to a whole variety of platforms because it worked out really nicely. Here's a port that was done later uh, in a much higher graphics mode because it worked, right? He worked on the game and then the graphics were secondary. They were nice, but he made sure the game was fun. And he had, he'd had a problem, you see, with Karateka, which was 
he didn't expect it to be ported. And when it was sold to Broderbund, Broderbund turned around and said, okay, we're going to port this. And the developers who were assigned to port it would look at the code and they're like, we don't get it. So they would just from scratch rewrite it because it was faster. <clears throat> this really bothered the hell out of Jordan because he would see that the action was different, all the work he'd done on timings was different. He resolved that with when he was working on Prince of Persia, if this thing was to be ported, it was going to be the cleanest source ever. He was going to comment it. He was going to make it all obvious. He was going to document this thing top to bottom so that he could guarantee that the ports would work exactly the same. And he did. And it was ported. And it was good. I want to point out that he wrote a book called The Making of Prince of Persia where he kept a near daily journal from the early days of thinking about doing this game all the way up through its publication and then later it's being sold to Ubisoft and it's on his site and it's a wonderful book. It is 300 pages. It is massive. And if you want to understand a developer growing from a teenager or a, an early college student into a full professional developer, this is a great friggin' book. Prince of Persia was sold to a company called Ubisoft and Ubisoft proceeded to produce additional titles. So this is when you say to somebody, hey, you know about Prince of Persia? They're going to respond one of two ways. Oh, yeah, I played Sands of Time. Um, I played sequel, 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 sequel. Or, yeah, I saw that movie. Or more, or more likely, I didn't see that movie. It was made into a movie with Jake Lionhall. It was a it was an action adventure flick, having a white guy play an Arabic prince. Well, whatever. But the people, it was a good uh, use of it. It had a lot of the same sense of his 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 stuff. So, in other words, it had it had achieved his dream. He was now a Hollywood produced screenwriter, who was now with this game. So, of course, he would be this guy who saved everything, would want his old stuff. And he had lots of his old discs, his old Karataka discs, his old pieces of uh, uh, code that he had written when he was younger and everything. But they were generally on five and a quarter inch floppies. And to his horror, he discovered he did not have the Prince of Persia source code. It was completely gone. He wrote to the uh, now retired uh, owners of Broderbund. He wrote to developers he'd worked with. Nobody had a copy. It was completely lost. And he was really sad about this because he was somebody who kept a small but well-maintained history of himself and an admirable piece of work for what he's done and so that's where he stood for years until when his father was moving out of his apartment his father said hey i found some of your old stuff mailed it to him and in there was this the prince of persia source code so the prince of persia source code had been sitting on a three and a half inch floppy for many years in the closet of a nice old guy in New York, and it was now in Jordan's hands. Jordan wrote to his blog, which he obviously maintains very well, and said, whoa, look what I found. How do I get this off? How do I remove this? And bless their hearts, the second comment is, you have to call Jason Scott. How delightful. I am so delighted that when I have my name being searched for by my various RSS feed readers that look for mentions of me, I, there are some conversations out there where someone's like, how do I rescue this old thing? Call Jason Scott. And then I go, hello, what? <laughs> That's the magic of the modern world. I'm very delighted by it. Well, you know, he called me in. And just so you understand, you know, one of the problems with floppies is that they kind of, like, they kind of lied about the whole lifetime guarantee thing. Hasn't worked out. Uh, the, the computer industry is 50 years of over-promise and under-deliver and continues to be to this day with beautiful graphics that lie to you and lie to you and lie to you. And you go, you're lying to me. And it goes, no, I'm not lying to you, therefore lying to you more. And the thing is, is that they were presented as this kind of permanent storage. But they're not. They're little pieces of plastic with a very thin coating of magnetism that then are being used to read, but more likely are being used to decay and lose everything on them. You know, I, I wrote a, an article called Floppy Disks, It's Too Late, about two years ago, to the great anger 
of some people who were like, it's not too late. I was like, it's kind of late. <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna go on the side of probably should gather your shit up and leave. It's really late. Last call happened a while ago. If you want to extract data from floppies, please do it now. Because, yeah, some people, they get 100% reads. They get the data off. Other people, not so lucky. If you have something like old commercial games, problem's not so bad. We do not have to worry about whether anyone has a copy of Doom. It's been handled. We got it. Okay? We got it. We got, we got, we got tomes of information about how Doom was made. We have recordings of every developer associated with Doom talking about it from his perspective. We have a book called Masters of Doom that talks about every single second, as far as I can tell. It's the one where John Carmack kills the cat. It's a great book. <clears throat> You're like, no, he doesn't kill a cat. Yeah, he kills a cat. And the thing is, is um, the cat was too loud, so he just had it put to sleep because it annoyed him. Anyway, so that counts as murder. I think it's murder. Cat didn't know. Cat, didn't. cat was in prison for a crime it didn't know it committed and then died. Anyway, so Doom is handled, where in Carmen San Diego is handled, and now Prince of Persia is handled because we were lucky to be able to extract it when we did. There's a whole bunch of variety of ways to extract data off of floppy disks, right? Obviously, um, uh, an ideal world would be where you take a floppy disk and you convert it to whatever modern platform you're in. That would be an ideal situation. Now, I want to preface this by saying that like everything else in the entire planet, preservationism is infested with tiny kingdoms and tiny kings sending little text slings and arrows in their little kingdoms and their fiefdoms going, oh, no, not the king. But putting that aside, there's a variety of methods. And so one of them is the disk ferret, which is a... USB to uh, floppy controller. And so what you see there is um, you can see the, uh, the, 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 this is a prototype board. But the, what's interesting about it is that it utterly takes over the functionality of the floppy drive. So your floppy drive, your, your Teak floppy drive, can be forced to read Apple II, Atari, Synthesizer discs, it can read uh, anything that used a five and a quarter inch floppy, basically, a up to and including doing a massive magnetic read so that we can figure that shit out later. So there's all sorts of options. Read the format, read outside the format. Um, there's a program out there that's called the Cryoflux from the Software Preservation Group. It is an excellent piece of hardware. Um, it has all sorts of accommodations for floppies. They are particularly proud of their efforts in being able to make sure that you have the best possible copy. They work very hard to make sure. So they're called the cryoflux because it is just reading the magnetic flux. A 360K floppy drive will, will end in a 20 megabyte image of that floppy disk because it will have not just the data, but sometimes we'll have the data done by the duplication company putting something on the outside for itself. We're finding all of this crazy metadata in the outside of these pieces of plastic that are inside this disk. So the Cryoflux is one of the leaders, part of the software preservation group. They really dig the Amiga, but they work with a whole variety of others. And I also wanted to mention the FC5025. Same idea, little tiny package, reads them. I like it when there's multiple groups, even when they hate each other. And they do, because I think we really benefit on the outside, because we say, okay, well, you know, they have this and you don't, and they go, well, fuck you, we'll put it in tonight. Whereas before, you might say, well, look, we're your best solution, stick with us. I like a little bit of conflict. If it becomes toxic and unusable, then it's a little bit of a problem, but I think there's something to be said. So now you know, there's this, and there's other attempts to read. You know, people care about these old floppies. So I knew there was all these solutions out there when he contacted me and I said, I'm going to fly out to you and we're going to go over this. 
But I discovered there was a much better solution. Um, uh, this is not that solution. This is a uh, connection to, I wanted to point this out very quickly actually. Okay, so this is a flop, this is, this is a Teak floppy drive, the, 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 G the GFR. Um, always ask for the GFR on your eBay and buy 10 because they probably are all broken. And if you look, there's this weird little, like you look at that one part in the middle that's blue and you're like, that's not stock. And that is in fact an additional index hole reader. Let me tell you about a problem you didn't know you had until now. The older floppy drives had two index readers. So you would read it and now you're reading it like this. You could read from the opposite side as well. And then you wanted your thing to read over here. See, you can't read over here now. It's not in the same place. So for the audience that isn't in the ceiling, let's try that again. <laughs> right there, you can read it. Flip it around. Oh, fucked up. Fuck mountain. Nothing for you. Like I said, a lot of these just had two index readers. This this is the uh, guys who made the disk ferret sending me a hand-modified second index so that it could read Apple II disks that were flipped over. Did they flip over Apple II disks? All the time. I don't know how many people are aware of the Karataka Easter egg. Karataka Easter egg. And oh, please, run home right now and try this. Because you can't do it online. You put it in and you play Karataka. You take it out and you put it in upside down, Karataka plays upside down. Um, and Jordan tells the story, you know, in a very effective way about, wow, you know, it's amazing that Broderbund was so open to doubling the cost of their duplication just to mess with people. But they loved that they would get a tech support call of, it's playing upside down. And they would say, well, just flip the disc over and put it back in. It'll work fine. Because it would. And that they were ruined for games forever. So modifications like this have to be done to be able to read these crazy discs. And like I said, I, I had all these options. But um, I ended up going with the best option of all, which is you call in a guy named Tony. So on the right there is Tony Diaz. On the left is Jordan Mechner. Tony Diaz is a badass in the world of Apple II. And it turned out that he lived within 100 miles of Jordan Mechner. And if it sounds odd that Tony would then load up his car full of all the equipment he needed and drive 100 miles to read Prince of Persia, you don't know Tony. Tony brought a lot of equipment. But we were going to guarantee there was no chance that this was going to go away. Tony wanted to read it on original hardware that had been maintained. That is the crazy other option. Read it from the original stuff. And there are ways to do this. There's programs called Apple Disk Transfer that puts up a little client on an Apple II and forces it to read that way. They have it for Commodores and other things. Tony wanted to just look at the thing like it was meant to. And he did this thing that was amazing to me. I'll still remember this because Jordan, of course, was a little nervous. I'm bringing in a guy. <clears throat> and so When you get your fucking cement lucite block stuck inside of another black lucite block that gets you arrested for 12 years for opening it or staring at it too long, remember before we fucked it up, please, okay? So the way that the Apple II worked was that, as you can see, it was a little easy to get into. Inside of the Apple II are a variety of slots for you to put in these cards. 
This is the card that gives it the ability to read from a floppy disk, not built in automatically. Similarly, this is something that enables it to do lowercase. <laughs> Just so you understand when we're getting back to basics. And I'm not, let's, let's put this straight, okay? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not a full horse doctor here. I'm not able to look at this thing and tell you much. But Tony, Tony opened up uh, Jordan's computer, and he was like, well, it looks like you put in 16K. You bought this thing between August and uh, September of this year. You then put in a second one here, and then you tried to modify this aspect, and then you pulled it out again. And Jordan just looked at him, and he was like, yeah, I remember in that summer I went down to New York City and I bought that part. And then I went over here and I bought that part. And we were going to do this and we decided against it. At that point, Tony was in. So it turned out actually that reading it was, I wouldn't say it was anticlimactic, but it was certainly something where because all of the appropriate pieces were in place, knowing who to find, Having the stuff there, getting the trust, setting things up, made the actual process really simple. Turned out that what he had done was he had backed up a small five megabyte hard drive onto five floppy disks, producing a modified disk image of the development environment of Prince of Persia. So it was there was some stuff to be done, but Tony didn't think anything of it. He just booted up the thing that read it, read it straight off. I, meanwhile, tried taking the disks and running them through a disk ferret. So here you can see where it's doing this massive calibration, massive pull-in. It's trying to read the, how much acquired data there is and convert it. So it's trying to be very careful, but Tony knew exactly what he was doing. So within seconds, he had a backup program booted up from his collection, undid the backup, and had it written out. And initially, we did it, of course, with everything but the Prince of Persia disk, because we were nervous. So we were running with some other things. For instance, we booted up and found this. Jordan Mechner had written an Asteroids clone in his first try before Karatika. And this was because Broderbund said, man, we could really go for an Asteroids clone. That game's selling like hotcakes. In between when he started to write it and when he finished it, Atari had sued over Pac-Man the Casey Munchkin case. Um, if anyone here doesn't know the Casey Munchkin case, well, good, you're not wasting your so much time as I am. I'm wasting the life you don't have to. <laughs> but the Casey Munchkin case was one of the first look and feel cases where a game was just enough like Pac-Man that Atari, who had the license for the home version of Pac-Man, was able to successfully say, too much like Pac-Man, get out of here. And so they got cold feet. And instead of calling it Blasteroids or Running Rocks or Hooray, We're Shooting at Things, they ended up just killing the project. So this beautifully done, and I mean it is beautifully done, picture-perfect, pixel-perfect emulation of, uh, of asteroids had been lost for 20 years. It's now up on the Internet. Similarly, a program he wrote called Death Bounce. Death Bounce itself was a really silly program. But he had done some work on it, and he had this interesting game idea that he was working out. And at the time, they want shooty-shooty. They don't want cinematic delight. And so he did that one. They decided against it. He decided against it. And when he put it up for people to look at, um, somebody wrote a JavaScript um, emulator of, of, of the Apple II. And so it's possible now to go online, look for Death Bounce in JavaScript, and you can immediately play it anywhere on anything because of the fact that now all we need is the data. Now, Quadris is an interesting story. All right. So, Broderbund was offered Tetris, and they turned that shit down. No, thank you. I'm under the impression some of it might have been a little bit that there was a little bit of sketchiness involved and everything else, but basically they said, no, we don't want this product anymore. This ain't working for us. And so they returned it. Now, by returning it, the developers had to, you know, give it all back. They had to d delete their local copies, right? But one of their developers, Roland Gustinson, really liked the game. 
So he quietly, inv- from scratch, rewrote a whole new version of Tetris just so they could play it. And he called it Quadris because it has four blocks. And remember, this is 1983, 84. And so he wrote this crazy thing. And we're playing with it. We're like, damn, boy did a good job of Tetris. And we hit this button because we're like, where the hell do you do this? And this screen of text comes up. And we realize we have stumbled onto one of the long lost relics of the ancient era, the boss key. The boss key was created for the whole variety of arcade games where you press them and they turn into spreadsheets. So that if you were playing and the boss came down the hall, you'd be like, boom, Apple works. Boom, Lotus123. Yeah, boss. Boom, keep going where you're going. Because it was a pause key. And you're just like, yep. He had written one there because he didn't want anyone to know that he had rewritten Quadris from the scratch of, of that. Also note, may cause wrist fatigue, warning at the bottom. Now, Roland Gustafson is a very interesting character. This is a weird thing. This is Roland Gustafson talking on Metafilter about a routine he wrote with his copy of that routine on the floppy disk that he took with him from Rotorbund in 1982. And a part of you was like, don't put it up against the screen, dude. But okay, fine. This is RW18. Now, RW18 is the secret great payload of the Prince of Persia source code. And again, keeping in mind the historical value of this, Apple Disks had 16 sectors per track. He got 18. He did it by doing this massive spiraling of the data and was able to get another 10, 20% of data on an Apple II disk. This really fucked up pirates. Because you would pirate the game, and when you were done, it was bigger than your disk. And you'd go through the code, and you're like, this is all valid code. There's no empty spots. And you're like, what the shit? And so you'd have to release it as two floppies. And everyone would be like, what's up with the lame two floppy release? They're like, we can't do anything about it. That's what it is. They would put a little fake break in that says, press this for part two. Because they had nothing to do. Because it was secretly the RW18 protection scheme. We got the code off. And we did what you should do. We put it on GitHub. Where it is to this day. Now, this to me is one of the things that I wanted to, to, to really mention is this massive cultural clash between the years of Jordan Mechner doing Prince of Persia and this year. Because we sat here, we wrapped up a friggin' golden egg for these guys, right? We got this jeweled Fabergé egg of, of, of vintage, well-sourced, well-commented program code from a game from night, something where... John Romero went on to it and wrote us and was like, wow, I learned like 10 new things reading this thing. Like this thing was an amazing piece of work. And what did people get hung up on? Who wants to guess what the big problem was with our release of the source code on GitHub? The fucking license. The fucking license. The people who were like, Well, can you release it under GPL? Can you release it under open? And Jordan's like, no, I can't. And here's why. In 1991, he sold all rights to Ubisoft. He sold absolutely all rights to Ubisoft. And he he was in a weird place with this. He basically said, do what you want to, look at it, learn it, but uh, you you can't call it Prince of Persia because somebody owns that. And, uh, you know, don't sell it. And it was like, come look. And it's like they're sta- it's like somebody standing over the Gutenberg Bible going, well, what's the copyright on this thing? And I had somebody who mentioned, who had the balls to show up and mention, oh, the Internet, you create incredible things. You know that thing where you squeeze, like, and the thing that you cut its hair, the little Play-Doh thing? It's like that, but shit. 
And this guy explained about how we were putting his career at risk by having this non-Chinese firewalled corporate source code released into the wild without an open license. And I was like, I'll take that rap. I hope you go to jail and can't eat or, s or feed your kids because someone goes, man, you totally lifted that from Prince of Persia, Apple II version, assembler. <laughs> oh, that was the other thing. It was an assembler, of course. So there were a lot of people who came and said, what is this? I always loved that. But it, but it was even funnier because, like, where do I put this? Like, they were just like, where do I put this to make a game? Lost. So you can see down there, there's the Prince of Persia source, and then there's the disk routines and disk protection. And that's the secret thing. All of the RW18 source code is out there now. Right? All this amazing effort to do something cool, and all the ways that he learned to do this amazing trick are now out there in the open, exactly how they're created. And like I said, unbelievably commented. I mean, it has been a brilliant time when this thing came out. This thing came out about five months ago. Uh, we got in Wired. We got in Gawker. We got in a whole bunch of places because the story tells itself, right? It's just ancient game, now released, Prince of Persia, awesome, rescued from the sands of time. Um, he had the sword, <clears throat> the, the knife that, like, makes the sands of time go backwards, and we put it on the Apple II. And to my surprise, a few people have hacked it. Not many, but a few people have hacked it. And um, um, I want to end this, this, this release of this code with, with a, a couple notes before I tell you about my favorite branch of Prince of Persia. But the lesson I want to get along is, you know, this history is important. If you have access to this history, it is important. And the fact is, is you are generating history now in your modern lives. You're creating these amazing things, and nobody knows it. And try to imagine, if you are the guy, if you're the Roland Gustinson, and you're creating an RW18, and nobody knows it, and you're, la you're leaving it on various files, or you're leaving it at work, you know, some of the best work has been spirited away out of a company and stored away until nobody gives a shit. I promise you, the nobody gives a shit event horizon is closer than you think. Don't get hung up on that. Yes, I am literally telling you to steal from work for later generations. They will thank you. So all these different things came in, and some people went in and screwed around, and you know they, they kind of tweak, tweaked with it. If you look up, there's 2,891 people watching, which is kind of funny. Um, but this one guy did this one modification, which was he removed all the copy protection checks. And you can see there a little bit of the code. LDA red herring, red herring 2, where it was basically not just using the code to check for numbers, but then it was using the checks to check the check and saying, are all the checks still the same amount of code or have they been modified too? And any of that to get rid of it. And then that's when I really realized this guy had done it. He had found the holy grail. He found the three-step process to ensure that all content will always be available and you will always be able to pirate any game no matter what. Step one, game is released. Step two, wait 22 years. <laughs> Step three, patch now released source. Victory. I just want to say, you know, um, um, this kind of stuff is really weird. You could be learning something about security and actually helping your job. Uh, I believe that DerbyCon is a, a place that people have come to uh, when there's many other cons like it because they feel a special affinity for both the organizers and the approach of this place. And I think that if this place has any kind of a theme, it's really working hard to be as social as possible and to share as much. And so I know that you cannot possibly justify this cost to anyone you work for anywhere that you are in here. Well, except for, yeah, except for if boss is on meth. But <laughs> meth bosses approve everything. But, but the thing is, is I just want to, I, I mean, 
I realize that this this is something that uh, you don't have to be here for. So if 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 you need something to take away, that that's just that's going to be like the thing that justifies it. It's that uh, programming is forever. That we learn all the time from things new and old. There's no such thing as out of date, merely out of reference. And so when you see things like this, and you see and you hear about caches of history, you know, treat them with respect, treat them with love, because they are part of what made you you, even if you didn't know it. Finally, I'm going to have this Apple II out on the vendor area, we haven't figured out where, for the weekend, for you to enjoy, to maybe get your hands on it. Because I know it's funny, because as we're getting, as we're getting around, you know, some of the older people in the audience are like, well, yeah, an Apple II, thanks. But other people, they may, not, they may have never seen one, and I think there's a benefit to being able to actually touch one to understand what uh, Jobs and Wozniak did here. You know, Wozniak's incredible design and then Jobs' idea of encasing it in plastic in this way to produce a form factor that worked this way with no fan that they later regretted and had to add a fan to. Um, you know, there's, there's so much to learn from just being able to touch the history. And so I'm going to give, finally, one more shout out to the LouisvilleArcade.com, who are local. Because guess what? I did not fucking bring this thing through TSA. Because that would have been hard to explain. Oh, this is a bomb. But anyway, so this is a, um, the other half. I've just noticed this. The other half is a tattoo parlor ad. So if you want a tattoo, or if you want to learn about arcades, um, Louisville has a very, very vibrant retro community, and I'm sure they would welcome you, even from where you are now. Thank you very much. My name is Jason Scott. That's, that's one way to reach me. I've been involved in a lot of other projects. I wanted to talk about this. I embargoed it for about five months to give Tony the chance to talk about it at, stick with me here, the five-day Apple II Festival that is held in Kansas every year. I have never, you see, half of you were like Apple II, and half of you were like five days. <laughs> that's what I think is so brilliant. It is one of the most magical times I've ever had. I've been there twice. It is magical because they really do believe in their equipment and their and 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 this hardware and this machine and they love it so much. And it just effusively why do they have it 5 days? Cuz every day a few people show their brand new Apple II products that they've made. Somebody has made um just last year we had the release of the I believe it's called the uh, CFA um oh I'm oh I'm sorry. I don't want to misspell it, so I'm not going to do that, but it is a compact flash to Apple II converter that allows you to plug in a compact flash and have every floppy right there presenting itself. Yeah. Apple II Ethernet, got it. Apple II Twitter, they got it. It is one of the most honest, lovely folks I have ever met. Those people are amazing. Uh, and it's called, it's called KansasFest.org. It's amazing. Anyway, uh, so, so Tony got the chance this year to talk about it at Kansas Fest, about it from his point of view and why he did it. And uh, I, I have to send so much love to this guy. He's there on the left. You can see me absolutely delighted. Thanks, Wired. Favorite photo of me ever. Um, I look like they fucked up my plan. I mean, that's pretty much the look on that face, right? He's like, oh, shit. It's like halfway through the producers, right? It's just like, oh, no, I, I, ha I was shorting the source code extraction. <laughs> Fucking A. Anyway, so, so anyway, so, but Tony, Tony, that's what Tony looked like the whole time. What a great fact that we have people like this who care enough about the old equipment. Does anyone have any questions about anything? Let's, okay, we're going to go, how much time do I have red shirt? Okay. Oh, is the next speaker here? Oh. Does the next speaker never want to have his slot? I'm sure he does. Uh, all right, let's go very quickly. You, yes, go. Was, 
Yeah. Oh, what's with you? A flippy disc what? Yes, people have them. Flippy disc punches, which are punches, because here's the deal with this. You would have a floppy disc, okay, and they would test it. If the other side was kind of bad, they made it a single-sided disc so that you would have a, a notch on the side that would say you can read this, read write this side, but you can't read this side. People went, okay, well, shitty works for me. I can save a buck. So they would make a little thing that would punch out the side and let it read that side. One of the stupidest ideas. That's like, I don't know. I, I, that, that's like waiting for the meat to go into the bargain bin. I just don't think that's a really smart idea. In the back there, with the, yeah, right there, go. Yeah. Best way to do that is to realize that it is an ongoing process that's probably once every two to three years. Sorry, it's like doing your smoke batteries. It's just there's nothing you can do. But every two or three years, try to get it over to another location. I try to follow the Google rule, five copies in three locations. Um, and and you, you move it forward. It's perfectly OK to do the Russian doll method. Just take your hard drive, make it a folder on the new hard drive. Take this hard drive, make it a folder on the next hard drive. It's perfectly okay. In 1995, I tell people, 1995, it used to take a minute and a half to open up a JPEG. By 2000, thumbnail views are the default view, okay? We have things that can just do this now. This is why Facebook is now going, is this your friend? Or Apple's, Apple, some of Apple's iPhoto is going like, is this a two-person photo? We're fine, just keep storing the shit. But about every two or three years, because it has to keep up. Uh, who else, is there anybody else? I didn't know this was gonna become an auction. Uh, you, you first, then you. None. There is no good long-term hard drive storage. You are writing on a thing spinning at the speed of fucking light into a, you are basically taking a, a you know, did someone describe, like the situation with a hard drive head is like taking a 747 and plugging it into a field of grass to extract one piece of grass, okay? No. Yes, print that shit out and put it on a bunch of them and then watch as they all die, one by one. I'm sorry, it's a little downer, but it's true. Thank you. Are we done? I will be around all weekend. I love stories about this. I don't like stories so much in which you tell me nothing. I've gotten too many of those in my life. Please don't do that. I'll let you know that. But if you're trying to, if we're trying to learn something together to make things better in the world, I would love to speak to you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>